Well, good morning. morning. Northview, great to be here. Um, That video, uh, those words, there are a lot of things I could say, and um, I I just wonder if you heard the lyrics. Uh, They started with, I hurt myself today to see if I still feel, I focus on the pain, the only thing that's real. You know, um, last week we talked about the false self, and sometimes when we live in that false self, everything becomes so fraudulent, so fake, so superficial, that the only thing that is real is pain in our lives. And sometimes people hurt themselves just to be able to determine that they're still alive and they do feel. You might be headed in that direction. Uh, You might be there now. Maybe there's somebody in your family that you know that's where they are in that false self life. That's what we talked about uh, last week. And, um, you know, when Johnny Cash performed this, uh, it's a song, Hurt, it's written by somebody in his 20s. Johnny Cash was in his 70s. And um, he didn't know, but, you know, at the end, the lyrics are, what have I become my sweetest friend, everyone I know, goes away in the end, and his wife, June, died three months later, and then he died four months after that. The images in the video are quite amazing. A man that um, picks up a mask, puts on all this stuff, makes all these mistakes, and then the clock is wound back, and he's able to maybe see what was coming. Boy, if we could only turn back the clock and and then redo everything that we have been done. Again, the lyrics, if I could start again a million miles away, I would keep myself. I would find a way. So this whole series is about keeping yourself, or if you've lost some of yourself, to try to take that back, to take your life back or a portion of your life. Here's here's the verse that sums up last week. But evil people and imposters will flourish They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You can trust this church that what they teach, what is taught here is true. But what we have here are, uh, not here but in the world, imposters. And if we follow the imposters who deceive us, We become deceived and we deceive others and we wonder where is this life that God has promised for me? Where is the blessing? Because it's all so fake and so much deception. That is not God's plan. Well, this week I wanna talk to you about the reactive life, how we respond, not respond, but react to all these things, how we come to live as we are. But before we get into that, I just have to take a little turn here because I want to help the men in the audience. I'm the teaching pastor. I want to teach you something. It's Valentine's week, and on the 14th, Valentine's Day is coming. So I went online and went to Amazon.com, and I saw recommendations of gifts for her. Now, I want to tell you something. If you buy some of those gifts, you're going to be in big trouble. And I pointed out some things here. I brought some that you simply must not buy. You can check it out. These are actually on the recommended gifts for her. Number one, the Guardman 11-in-1 Beer Opener Survival Card Tool. Let me tell you something. If she needs a beer opener to survive, she needs treatment, not that. The gift needs to be treatment. You won't believe this one. Recommended for her. Deluxe Blackhead Remover Extractor Tool Set. Let me tell you, if you think that that's romantic, you need treatment. Okay. Oh, this is one of my favorite. The Vermont giant four feet tall teddy bear. No, no. That teddy bear doesn't leave the toilet seat up or, or turn the thermostat too far down. You get that for your wife within two years, you're divorced, or if you're dating, you will definitely break up. You can't compete with a four foot tall teddy bear. Number four. The Easy SMX Gaming Headset with Comfortable LED 3.5 milliliter stereo over-the-ear headphone with mic for the best in computer gaming. No. (laughs) 
if she would want this, you need to destroy the computer. And if in reality, you're giving it to her because you want it, well, this Father's Day, expect those uh, yoga pants that fit her perfectly to be your gift. <laughs> and then a unique set of six guitar picks, heart-shaped with I Pick You, printed in six different styles. No, pick something else. And then these two, these are the last ones, they go together. The Toilet Night Light by Rainbow motion sensor turns on the color-changing LED lights the moment she sits down. No, she does not need a private light show. It's just... And then this, I think it's made by the same people. The Just Paper Roses toilet paper imprinted in romantic red, I love you from top to bottom. <laughs> Free shipping. <laughs> now, you know, you can never go wrong by getting her a day at the spa. I'm surprising my wife with a day at the spa. She'll be so shocked to know that I got the whole thing, the, medic, the pe uh, pedicure, manicure, uh, oil change, the tire rotation, the whole thing, whatever they do there, it takes a whole day. <laughs> He's going to have it done. Anyway, that's just the way to go. Now, I read some research this week that 83% of U.S. adults who go to a church choose it because of the quality of the sermons. If you find that to be a problem here, Steve Poe is back in March. So <laughs> don't change churches in February. That's my motto. Now let's get down uh, to business. And uh, you can uh, follow along in the detailed outline that you have on the back there. Reactive living, how we came to live as we live. Here's the first point. Living in and out of a false self is living a reactive life. We don't respond if we're in the reactive life. We're always reacting. We're kind of at the mercy of other people. If they're nice to us, well, our reactions are great. If they're not, or if life is disappointing, we are just reacting as we go along. And of course, the number one reaction is hiding. Adam and Eve, when they committed that first sin, and of course, we're all part of the Adam's family after that, we do what they do. We often think, well, if I'd been Adam, you know, I'd never. Hey, we do it all the time. We mess up and we try to cover it up. We try to hide. We try to act like there's no problem. It's as if we do something wrong and we, we say to ourselves, hey, uh, this is a great idea. No one's ever thought of this before. I'm going to cover this up. I'm going to start to fake it. I'm going to try to hide this, and it never, ever works. But it's the most common home remedy that does not work. And we end up, look at this uh, verse in Romans, we end up with claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools if we're in the reactive life. Now, what is it that we're reacting to? Well, point number two, we develop unhealthy reactions to shame, pain, and fear. We react to a lot of things, but these seem to be the three headliners that cause us to destroy our lives the most, to defeat us, and then many times to define us. Now, when we look at shame, where does this come from? Well, a lot of times we get messages from parents. Sometimes they don't mean to, but I have heard of parents telling their children, you're worthless, you ought to be ashamed, and, and you get, get this label of shame on you. Uh, sometimes it's being neglected. Sometimes it's trauma, abuse, sexual abuse throws millions and millions and millions of moments of shame onto a person for one moment of gratification. Oh, it's, it's tragic. And so here's what happens. Here's how it plays out. In shame, well, we feel like we're terrible. We're worthless. We're horrible creatures. We don't measure up. So we have no need for standards because we're worthless. So then we will do anything and everything to survive because it doesn't matter. We're worthless. We don't live up to a standard because we don't have any reason to. That's what shame does to us. And then fear. Fear causes us to frantically latch on to anything that provides momentary security. You know these people. They would rather be attached to someone sick 
than not attached to anything at all. They bring some up by, someone by and, and they're dating and you go, whoa, this guy's carrying an ax. He's an ax murderer. Hey, well, you know, I love him. He's special. He really respects me. He's going to protect me. He's going to kill you. Some of you might be thinking, oh, that's what I did. Don't nudge anybody at this point. But we, we, we want to be connected to something rather than be on our own, and that's because of fear. And then pain. Well, pain causes me to do anything and everything to find comfort. So I, I, wanna, I wanna erase the pain rather than embrace it, which scripture tells me to do. So I eat to be comfortable. I take drugs, I drink, I gamble, whatever, pornography, to feel some comfort in this existence. But it doesn't last, it doesn't provide the comfort, but, but comfort becomes my God. I think I've gotta do everything I can to not live in pain. And so I, sacrifice, I eat, I sacrifice my body to the God of comfort. I get addicted, I sacrifice my body and all my relationships to the God of comfort. At some point we have to say maybe comfort is not the goal. Maybe with some help and some different things, I could handle the pain rather than bringing more pain on me. Hosea 13, 13 says, pain has come to the people like the pain of childbirth, but they're like a child who resists being born. The moment of birth has arrived, but they stay in the womb. All of this pain that goes on and right when we could be birthed into a new life full of blessing and meaning and fulfillment, we stay in the womb because it's so comfortable there, because there's no challenge, no risk. We just want to stay right there. And our lives become addicted to predictability and sameness in the comfort of the womb that we created for ourselves. We have to have faith to be born and reborn into a fallen world. Point number three, reactive living, is taking matters into our own hands, living according to our own vows and declarations and the things that have been developed from our hurt, the hurt place within us. So rather than be open to what God has for us to follow his word, we develop a code. We develop a code to protect ourselves full of declarations and full of vows. And maybe you've made some that you need to give up I will never trust a woman with my heart. All men are sex addicts. I will never be like dad. I will never show weakness. I will always protect myself. I will never, ever be hurt again. All women just want to control me. All Christians are weird. Okay, well, maybe some of them are true, but you can't live your life that way. Because that's your code, not God's. That's your way of dealing with it. And sometimes we'll make these declarations about ourselves. I'm not hurting anybody but me. Hey, I'm not that bad compared to them. I can do this on my own. That's how we live. That's our co code to control, protect, to toughen up, to guard my heart. And so I harden everything within me to protect myself rather than be open to responding to what God wants for my life. Hosea 10, 12. I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Plow up the hard ground of your heart. You know, all of us develop these things that produce a hardness of heart, and we need to do whatever it takes to plow it up. Rather than have these vows and declarations and judge people before we ever get to know them, make conclusions about them, we need to be willing to risk for the sake of unity and intimacy, which is what God wants for us. Look at Ephesians 4, 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Here's the direction. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, 
making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Every vow, every conclusion will destroy unity of the spirit. It will prevent you from binding with someone else coming together. It'll produce conflict rather than peace. Maybe if nothing else from this morning, you could just sit down and think for a minute, what are the vows that I'm living by? What are the conclusions, the decorations that I've made? Maybe I need to trust God rather than live according to that code. Number four, events and interactions trigger us back into the shame, the pain, and the fear from a different time and a different person. So often we are reacting to people and it's not really them that we're reacting to, it's somebody else, somebody out of the past. You might be reacting to your husband, but really it's your dad's head that's sitting on his shoulder. That's what you're really focused on. And the guy's sitting there going, I don't know what this is all about. Well, there are some things in the past that are triggering this. And when we, when we make allowances for each other, we find out what is it that this person's so sensitive to. But then the person needs to do the work to get rid of that trigger. Here's my uh, tree drawing here. It's a fruit tree, uh, as if you needed me to illustrate this for you. But you can see it's a fruit tree. It's got fruit on it, right? So it's great. We're supposed to have fruit as people like a fruit tree. Fruit is not for the tree. The fruit, the fruit is not eaten by the tree. The fruit that comes out of our life is not for us. It's for other people to experience. But here's what we do. If this tree goes bad and the fruit rots, falls off, won't grow fruit, we're so smart. We're so ge- we, go, we go to Michael's or Hobby Lobby and buy plastic fruit and we glue it up there so that we look really good. We still look like a fruit tree, but we're plastic. We're fake. Instead, We need to go down here and do some root work. Where did all this start? How did this happen? How did I react to this that if I change this, if I resolve this, repair it, and it's it's repairable, it's resolvable. We can do the work and no longer be reacting to something that happened years ago. And then the fruit will be bountiful and will bless us and will create just like fruit from a tree, seeds in it that plants life into this world. You know, it's hard work in this world. It's hard to break through all of this because we live in a fallen world. And it's so amazing to me that so many of us, I did it for years, think we can do it on our own. We think, I got it, I can do it, I'm strong enough. But look what we're up against. Not just a fallen world, but look at this verse. Right after you, okay. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Wow. Uh, That's supernatural stuff, supernatural evil stuff that is working against you. And yet we think, hey, I got what it takes. I don't need anybody but just me. I tell you, we fail. We react by trying to do it on our own and we fail. Now, when you add to this, um, to these mighty powers in this dark world, add to that the power of shame. And we we don't have a chance on our own. And so we have to take that risk to break out of our silence and our shell of isolation and come into contact with redemptive relationships. Psalm 34, look at this. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all of my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Now, when you look to God for the answers, you can free yourself of shame or God frees you from it. You can do things in a different way. But when we look to God, 
Oftentimes we look to him to fix everything, heal us, quick fix, and we think we're done. One of the problems in the Christian faith even, when it's not healing, but let's just say all of a sudden you're doing your quiet time or you start one for the first time. You feel like God's speaking to you in a rich way that he's never spoken before. It's just like words jump off the page that have never been there before. In your prayer, you just feel the presence of God. And here's the, here's the problem. Then we start to think, well, I'm so close to God, I don't need to do any work. And we always need to do the work. Even if you're miraculously delivered from a disease, healed, cured from an addiction, you still have to develop character. You have to go through a sanctification process. Nobody I've ever known is delivered into instant godly character. We need other people, and we need to do the work. There is action required. Now, number five, some react by acting out, and some react by acting in. Now, we all know what acting out is. That's the prodigal son. Rebellion. Obvious things that we do wrong. The child that that gets drunk, the child that gets the, the drug addiction, gets expelled from school, all of those acting out stuff. That's pretty obvious. But Satan uses everything. And the prodigal son had an elder brother. I preached on it before. And the elder brother was acting in. He wasn't free of sin. He was a rule keeper, absolutely, done everything right except deal with his inner resentment and jealousy and bitterness. He wasn't happy about a lost brother coming home. He was angry. Nobody ever threw him a party. And so here's, here's what's just so, so sad. Your soul gets hijacked even while you're keeping the rules. And the very rules that you keep, Satan will use them to produce this self-righteous entitlement or this disillusioned entitlement because you don't see anything but what's wrong and unfair and disrespectful and unresolved. And you will attack other people. You will judge them. And the love of Christ is anywhere but in your heart. Satan uses everything. And so it seems like, well, we can't win. Well, we can't unless we surrender to God. Whether you act in or out, whether you're an any or an Audi, doesn't matter. <laughs> Satan will use it, and you surrender it to God and work his plan, things start to change. Jesus wants to be there for you. We, rather than let him in, we, we slice off parts of our life and think, well, we'll just keep this secret. We'll just keep this from God. Well, you know, our sin... It separates us from God, but it doesn't separate us from God's heart. And many times, you know, we say, okay, we're going to do this secret thing. Nobody's going to know, but he sees it. He's there. There's nothing secret. Imagine trying to hide something from the creator of the universe, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, who died on the cross. And we think we're so brilliant because we do it in hiding. But if we look at scripture, Jeremiah 23, 24, can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and earth, says the Lord? You're not hiding from the Lord. Why do we think it's okay to even try to do that? We're not fooling God. Matthew 28, 20 says this, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God is everywhere. He is always with us. You know, I heard a man say what we, what we really need to do. Rather than throw God away, we need to invite God into whatever we're involved with because his heart is turned toward us and he's got some amazing things in store for us, even if we sin. His love is still there. I want to play a video of Dan Allender. 
He is the founder of the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. He says it better than I can. Well, I think what we really fear is that our sin divides us from God, and it does, but not from the heart of God. He's wild about us. He's wild about us when we sin. He's wild about us when we don't. He's wild about us in the past and the future. So God knows my sexual sin that's going to be committed two years from now. Uh, and he's still crazy about me in a way in which he's constantly pursuing and inviting, also disrupting uh, and calling forth the things that will ruin me and everyone else that's in my world. If I were really to believe that God will do everything and anything to capture my heart, including killing his own son, then, then I've got to have to deal with this simple fact. He's after me. Uh, and what do I want to do with a God who is relentless, good, and will not stop pursuing? Uh, I'm either gonna keep running and running and ruining, or eventually I'm gonna stop and turn around and go, what's with you? What is with you? What is this all about? Uh, do you really want me? Am I really your beloved? Do you really want to call me to danger that's really good? Do you really want me to subvert rules that are just stupid with regard to how we live life? And ultimately, do you really want me to do harm to the kingdom of darkness with all the gifts and all the harm I've endured, but with that, a, a kind of commitment to really alter the face of this earth? You see, that's a kind of calling that most men just go, look, I'm trying, I'm just trying to get enough money to get bread on the table, and you're inviting me to what? Uh, I'm just trying to get through my day. And I'm saying, oh, no, 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 no. You've been called to so much more of a beautiful and big story that if you were to again get just a glimpse of it, the pettiness of how most sexual sin goes by uh, would actually be able to be looked at like just a bad, uh, on the ground, dirty hot dog when what you have uh, is this Kobe steak uh, that has been well prepared for your body and your heart. The fact that you're listening to this is evidence that God is after you. He wants something so much more for you than the mundane that we're involved with. And as Dan Allender said, it's the difference between a hot dog and the finest steak that can be acquired on the face of the earth. Or if you're a vegetarian, the difference between a tofu dog and a kale and quinoa salad. I mean, just so you get that. God has so much for us. And he is always there with us. We cannot run from him. We cannot hide from him. He is there and he's wild about us. He's crazy about us. He knows we're going to sin, and he still loves us. He died for our sins before we ever committed a sin. He was there, sacrificing for us. Sometimes we need to stop, and we need to ask Jesus to enter into our world of temptation. He says, pray without ceasing, but many times we're tempted and we just block Christ off and we say, I'm just going to deal with this on my own and keep it secret. But if we would invite him into the temptation, perhaps he would show us why we are so tempted. Perhaps he would show us the roots of where it comes from. Perhaps he would show us the options that we have, but instead we act like we don't know him. Even more important is that we ask somebody in to our temptation. How many times would people be free of the sin if when tempted, they picked up the phone and they call somebody? I was trying to think of how I illustrate this and then I remembered my wife was working with a cutter. She truly, like the lyrics of those songs, uh, she would cut just to know that she was still able to feel. All she had was that pain. And so it just seemed like there was nothing that could help her or nothing that she would accept. And my wife said, hey, the next time you feel like cutting, would you do me a favor? Would you call me? 
I won't try to talk you out of it. I want to come be part of it. I want to know what you're feeling. I want to see where it is done. I want to experience the rituals with you. A few days later, she got a call. So she goes into the place where the cutting occurs. And she sees the rituals and she sees the blades and how they're prepared and all that goes in to this cutting ritual. Because all this person has is pain to let her know that she's still alive. And so my wife asked her questions. They talked about the whole process. And by the time their time was over, there was no need for her to cut herself. How many times would there be no need for the pornography, the alcohol, the drug, the relationship that is forbidden if we would ask someone who could help us into that space rather than react in isolation and believe that we're going to get away with it. Christ wants to enter into our destructive reactions and show us we have options, show us that we can do it in a different way. And no matter what we have done, he has grace for it all. And often he delivers that grace in many different unique forms that we never ever suspect. I was thinking uh, yesterday about the time when I actually was on trial. I had a trial uh, I was charged with killing. A lot of people don't know that about me, but I and my friends were charged with killing, and we went on trial for killing ducks after hours in Texas. In this county, if you pleaded innocent to killing ducks after hours, you were required to have a jury trial. Well, we, it was about 6 o'clock, and we shot some ducks, and the game warden comes over and says, you, you kill those ducks after time limit. Well, we didn't think we'd kill those ducks after the time, so we pleaded innocent. And then they sent us the thing, got to have a jury trial. Four of us friends, and Tommy Davis's dad was a dentist, so he thought he'd be a good attorney for us. All he knew how to do was pull teeth, and yet, here we are. So I'm first up on the stand. I don't know how they talk in courtrooms, all that language. And so the guy says to me, Mr. Arterburn, I'm thinking, hey, nice, Mr. Arterburn. Did you not kill those ducks after hours? And I'm thinking, did I not? Did I? Did I not? He's saying, okay, I, I did. I wouldn't say did. So he's saying, he's asking if I did not do it. And so I said, yes. No further questions. So we get to the, we get to the summation, and he says in his summation later on, even Mr. Arterburn admitted he killed those ducks. And I, I'm thinking, no, I said, if not, you said, did I not? And I thought you meant not. But in court, that's not the way they talk. Why can't they just be normal? Oh, they're attorneys. Okay, I forgot. All right, anyway, so, so the verdict came in, and we were found, fortunately, we were found innocent. After it was over with, we were standing around, and one of the jurors came out. He was wearing overalls, big farmer, um, Oshkosh by gosh, right there. I still remember it. <laughs> he says to me, boy, did you get confused up there on the stand? <laughs> I said, yeah, I didn't mean to confess. I, the guy, he, he messed me up. And he goes, <laughs> well, you're lucky. Because every one of us on that jury hates that game warden. <laughs> so we were innocent. Grace in the form of overalls. Oshkosh by God. God delivers it in many different ways. If we'll just ask him to help us, he'll come in. Now, number six, the reactive life is a compilation of survival strategies that can be changed. We can change we have the ability to change, but not without pain. One of the most profound verses is 1 Peter 4, 1. It says this, so then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had. 
and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. Another translation says you're not finished with sin until you're willing to experience pain. Hey, I used to eat 60 pounds heavier than I am. To stop eating, it's painful. To stop drugs, gambling, whatever it is, it requires pain. And if we're not willing to go into that pain, which is redemptive pain, purposeful pain, not wasted pain, if we're, if we're not willing to do that, we're not going to stop whatever it is that we've chosen in our reactive lifestyle. We have to commit, we have to stick to the commitment and bring people into our lives that can help us. There was a man who was overweight like I was and he decided that he was going to lose the weight. So he decided to change the route going to work that he was accustomed to, which would take him right by the donut shop where he would pick up a half dozen glazed donuts and eat them on the way to work. He said, I'm gonna take a different route. And so he did. And he quit eating those donuts and did quite well. But one day, he forgot and went down the old route, and there was the donut shop. Spiritual guy, he says, Lord, is this of you? <laughs> if this is of you, God, I'll know it's of you if right there in front of that donut shop, there's a parking space right there. And if it's there, I know it's from you. I'm going to pull right in. Sure enough, Right there in front of the front door was that parking space, and he only had to go around the block eight times for it to open up. Well, he had good intentions, but he just didn't know how to follow through. We've got to have the follow through, not almost, but completely. Number seven, the reactive life is defined by the choices we make to survive. And the life that is no longer reactive is a result of the choices that we make to heal. We have choices that we can pick. We have things that we can choose. Maybe we don't need healing, but maybe the choice is just to make life better. Now, there are a lot of things that you could do to instantly make your life better. One choice would be to take advantage of the half-price sale on carpet right now at Empire. 800 today. <laughs> I just can't help myself. I mean, you could do that. It'd be nice to have nice carpet, look better, all that. But maybe we need to go deeper and do some foundational work. Maybe we need to go under the floor and deal with root problems that will not be solved by just covering it over. That's what I'm hoping is going to happen for you. You'll do some root work this week. Maybe, just maybe, you would ask somebody to enter into your secret world when you're tempted. That's an amazing choice that seems to change everything. Maybe you would decide to talk to somebody about something you've never shared before. I talked to a lady who went to a support group for the first time in her life this week because she wanted to do something she'd never done before. I talked to a man who had never been to a counselor who didn't think you needed counseling, decided he would finally make that appointment with the psychiatrist to get the medication that he needed. People doing things out of their comfort zone so that everything would be different. Maybe this is the week to make a choice you've never made before. But whatever you do, don't forget this choice. Don't forget to read the manual. It's the Bible. Here's God's word. The, the God of the universe gives us his word, and we don't even open it up. We don't click on it, pull up the app, or open it. And I want to challenge you to be sure and just do that this week and see what is there. Listen, this verse here in 2 Timothy, it's amazing. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. That's a pretty decent guarantee on God's word, and we need to pick it up. We need to use it and put it into our lives. 
Now, if you don't like the Bible, if you don't want to learn from God, if you don't like, take your life back. I did go uh, to uh, Amazon, and I, and I found a book for you if you don't want to do anything. It's How to Change Your Entire Life by Doing Absolutely Nothing. There is a book by that title. It is so hard to get a book published, and somebody got that book published. <laughs> Six do-nothing exercises to do nothing to change your life. If that's what you want, it's right there, but I hope and pray that is not what you want. Now, I love great quotes from people, and I'll give you this one as we close up here. Unless someone, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And many of you know that's from the Lorax, Dr. Seuss. He's the one that said it. But truer words have never been spoken. And I hope and pray that you care an awful lot to try something different. Connect with somebody this week. Do something that you've never done before. And I hope you'll come back here next week for Take Your Life Back, number three. Now, a Harvard University nurses health study found that if you go to church, if you do something with the church twice a week, you lower your chance for death by 30%. Now, that's from Harvard. You can't argue with Harvard. You, you know, you can argue with Scripture, but not Harvard. So if you'll get involved in a group of some kind, a home group or a support group, a life recovery group, you will lower your chance of risk of dying by one-third. Now, some of you won't, and so we won't see a third of you here next week. But I hope the rest of you will come back and experience this.